We're the fourth in a convoy of what looks to be about four pickup trucks, all of them unmarked, no lights, no sirens, all the officers in plain clothes. We're with Ecuador's National Police Force as they're dispatched to a house with suspected ties to terror groups. They won't tell us where exactly we're headed, and they ask us to blur their faces. It shows you the level of concern and fear that exists here right now. So we'll keep it vague. We're just outside Guayaquil, Ecuador's largest city, and headed into one of the most violent areas, Duran. More than a dozen officers storm what could be mistaken for an abandoned barn, but their intel suggests otherwise. They cuff two men and search the high grass and weeds. On each corner, security cameras strategically positioned. Officers hack them down. As they leave here, we've noticed even he's carrying some evidence. It's like a gun and several rounds in that baggie. This is just one of thousands of raids across Ecuador carried out over the past two weeks. Ecuador's military now deployed to neighborhoods. We went with them. Over here, we see two guys who have been detained for now. Officials arresting more than 3,000 people so far. Ecuador's latest surge in violence sparked by the suspected prison escape of notorious gang leader Jose Adolfo Macias, known as Fito reported missing from this massive prison compound on January 7th. If you look over here, this is where officials tell us Fito was being held, possibly is still being held. They really don't know. A top military commander telling me the prison system is rife with mismanagement and heavy gang influence. So much so that Fito could still be hiding inside. Fito's disappearance led President Daniel Noboa to declare a state of emergency, vowing to neutralize terror groups. A day after Noboa's declaration, on January 9th, 13 armed men took over a television news studio in Guayaquil. They put guns to the heads of employees, forcing them to the ground, and held up what looked to be sticks of dynamite. Folks watched it all unfold on live TV, among them Camille Gamarra and her husband Diego Gallardo. Feeling the unease, Diego decided to pick up their 10-year-old son. But minutes before reaching his school, someone opened fire on the streets. Diego stopped messaging Camille, who was frantically trying to call him. A police colonel eventually answered and told Camille Diego had been shot. Chaos rocked Ecuador that day, especially in Guayaquil, where barricades went up and streets shut down. This young girl, still in her school uniform, also hit by a stray bullet. The hospital later saying she survived thanks to a security guard who drove her to the emergency room. A family friend was able to get Camille's son to safety, but Diego died before Camille could get to him. Across town, national police and armed forces stormed the television studio, capturing the gunmen before they could kill any of the hostages. And this is the studio where the terror group entered, and 13 of them. We saw firsthand the damage left behind. So this is the studio door, and you can see, I can count here, one, two, three, four, five, six, about a half dozen bullet holes. The day after our visit, in a brazen strike against the government, suspected gang members assassinated the prosecutor investigating that studio takeover. You can see he's pulling this car over right now. Police and military now stepping up their efforts, setting up random checkpoints. Every possible hiding place searched. I just saw one of the soldiers signaling to the other, look at his arm, look at his arm. They check tattoos for any gang affiliations and even scroll through people's phones. They also board commuter buses to get intel. He's asking, do they have anything they need to tell him or inform him about? He says, we're doing this operation for you all. Residents here struggle with what's happened to their country over the past few years. 
They tell me gangs are growing bolder and holding people and their businesses hostage, demanding protection money, known as vacunas. What happens if you don't pay the vacuna, if you don't pay the extortion? They get a contract killer and, and kill you. They put an explosive outside your, your store. The military tries to weed out those responsible, raiding homes like this one, holding the suspects at gunpoint as neighbors, including kids, watch. It's a lot to take in. She says the fact that there are police here, it's comforting. She accepts that and that there's military now patrolling the streets. What she doesn't like is that it goes into people's homes and it's now pouring out onto the street. But this is war. At least that's how the government here sees it. And they're asking the U.S. for support, desperate for tactical equipment, ammo, and intel. Why should the U.S. help? Because people will look at this from the U.S. and they'll say, well, that's Ecuador's problem. I mean, if, if you don't help us, probably you will see more people trying to cross the border. I mean, because these people is in the middle of gunfights on their neighborhoods. What would you do? Hey, you're not going to stay there. You don't want to stay there. No. Back on the front lines after executing their raid, we're reminded of the fear instilled by these gangs, even among law enforcement. <laughs> this officer putting on a ski mask in 90 degree heat and thick humidity before stepping into frame. And yet beneath those tactical layers, a soft spot. This soldier's not been home in a week, telling us the reason he's fighting is for his little girl. She wrote him a letter in English. I want you to know that everyone misses you here at home and we want you to return safe and sound. And I ask you to help the country to be a better place. You are number one. David Culver, CNN, Guayaquil, Ecuador.